Yo, I was just going to sit down and listen to somebody else do the lesson, so <laughs> whoever, whoever wants to, I guess, come on up. Now, I think uh, uh, some time ago I told you about a man who, uh, who fasted for four months in order to bring about unity, and that was sort of like clickbait, right? It was kind of true, but, you know, only if you understand it exactly right. Tonight I want to tell you about a man who wore the same clothes every night and day to help bring about strength. And that really is just exactly what he did. He wore the same clothes every night and day because the people needed strength, and that's how he was going to help them find it. I want to consider tonight from Nehemiah chapters 4 through 8 some things that he did there in order to help the people find strength when there were problems around them. Remember, we talked about a month ago about Nehemiah 1 through 3, and looking at Nehemiah and how he, uh, how he planned things, how he was so careful, how he spent so much time praying and thinking things through, because he saw a need, but he wanted to make sure to meet it in the right way. And uh, if, you, if you looked at the bulletin this morning, it's, there's kind of a, a more detailed review of that, because it, it all ties so close together, I wanted to make that available. But tonight I want to look at what happens next in the next four chapters. Because while he had done a lot to get the work started, to unify the people around the work, what happens anytime that you have some, some project, some program, some work that you were trying to do, is that there are always problems that crop up. There are always issues that arise, always difficulties that make it hard and sometimes end it all together. And so Nehemiah shows us some things that we can do that help us to overcome those. And it basically centers around three different things. First of all, Nehemiah was very careful to look at the problems that arose because of the work itself to help defend and strengthen the work. And this is, you know, they're building the wall. They've got it about this high. But can you imagine if your enemies came up when your wall is this high, kind of how you'd feel, you know? not It's just kind of like something to step over at that point, right? Not really all that helpful. And so they're building the wall, and they're doing the work, but they have some problems coming from the outside. Their enemies are sending in these letters. They have friends among the Israelites who will read the letters out loud. They're spreading rumors about how all the enemies are going to come up and destroy them in a moment. And they're concerned. The people really are terrified because the work that they're doing is drawing attention that they don't want. And so Nehemiah is trying to strengthen the people to keep the work going because the work has a problem. And so his solution is really twofold. First of all, he says, we're going to pray about this. And they do. They come together, not just individually, but as a group. And they spend time praying about the issue, about the problems and their fears. And then... He finds some people to help take care of it. He sets up some people as guards so that they can be watching out for these problems, so that they can have a solution and some actions to take to deal with the problem. But even after they've done that, people are still terrified. People are still scared. And so Nehemiah goes a couple of steps further, and he really helps them to center around God so that they are able to to find some solutions to help them accept their responsibilities and then to make sacrifices. And that's, that's where, uh, at the end of chapter 4, it says that they all wore the same clothes every night and day, uh, except when they were washing them. So they did wash their clothes. They'd all take turns at the laundromat, you know. And, and, but otherwise, they, they wore the same clothes in the day at night so that they were always ready to serve their shift on the wall and to defend the people if their enemies actually did come up. He found some creative solutions because the work presented a problem. Sometimes, sometimes it's not the work itself. Sometimes if there are problems with what we're trying to do, it's actually about the people. And that's the next uh, three chapters of Nehemiah are about the problems that the people themselves present. Nehemiah chapter 5 is about people who need help because they're being oppressed and another group of people who need help because they're, they're oppressing people and so therefore they're sinning. And when they come to Nehemiah and they say, look, The rich people have been taking advantage of us. The rich people have been taking our homes away. They've been taking our land away. They've been taking our work away. They've even been taking our wives and our children away. Nehemiah is just furious about this, but it says he stopped. It says after some serious thought, he went and he confronted those people, and he convinced them 
to do things God's way, to do things right. And so he solved this problem for those who were hurting, and he brought about the, uh, the repentance of people who were sinning. Because sometimes when we're trying to work together, it's sin that stands in the way of us accomplishing the goals that we have. And then he was also really careful himself. You know, he is now the governor of Jerusalem, but he was always really careful about how many taxes he would take, how many, you know, how much he would accept from people. And this is not a sermon about politics and taxes, but, you know, he was really careful about that because he didn't want anything to stand in the way of the work. But even after he helped those people, he dealt with more challenges concerning people. In Nehemiah 6, he's dealing with problems that he himself is facing. He's got the people from the outside, the, the enemies, and they're, they're sending in messengers trying to act like they want to help. And Nehemiah says, no, no, no. I'm just going to focus on the work. It doesn't matter what these false friends would say. Then they try to intimidate him. They're sending him messages about all the things that are going to happen if they don't listen, to, if he doesn't listen to them. But Nehemiah says, I'm just going to focus on the work. I'm just going to focus on what's right in front of me. Then he sends people who are supposed to be Nehemiah's friends, telling him to hide in the temple so that people see someone who's scared, people see who's someone who's afraid. And Nehemiah says, even when my friends stab me in the back, I just focus on the work because God's work is that important. And so he deals with that issue. And then they finally finish the wall. That was a big relief. They've built up to the top. And you kind of think maybe everything is over at this point. <coughs> but Nehemiah is now looking to the future. And he says, you know, the work doesn't stop here. Just because the wall is done doesn't mean that the work is over. And so he is looking to the future to figure out how can we keep problems from destroying the work? How can we keep problems from tearing it down? How can we keep problems from keeping us from growing? And so he finds leaders who care a lot about God. He finds workers and resources and tools so that the people are ready to work because sometimes, sometimes when you come across problems in the work, it's just that the people don't have what they need. The people don't have the tools they need or the resources they need. And so he helps them solve those problems. But then sometimes it's the work, sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's not either of those things. Sometimes the problem is with the word of God itself. Not that the word is the problem, but that our lives don't match the word. We haven't understood the word correctly. We're not lined up with the word. And so in Nehemiah chapter 8, when the wall is built itself, Nehemiah is still very concerned because he wants to make sure that the people have access to the word that they need to. And so he creates an environment along with Ezra and some other people to teach them the word and make people open to the word. And then he helps them to understand it, helps them to rejoice in it, even as they're mourning because they see the need for change. And he helps them to, uh, to make those changes as they have opportunity to do that. And so he, he is strengthening them depending on their needs. And every problem has a different need. Sometimes it's the work. Sometimes it's the people. Sometimes it is uh, our, our compliance with the word of God itself. But I think the real value that we see with Nehemiah 4 through 8 and the idea of strength is that Nehemiah essentially gives us three different questions that we can ask that when problems arise, when we're trying to work together, when we're trying to do things and be on the same page and help God's kingdom to grow, he gives us three different questions that we can ask when problems arise <coughs> so we can figure out how to get past the obstacle and how to keep moving forward. And so I'd like to just briefly consider what those three questions are and how they would help us. And the first question that Nehemiah would ask us if we're dealing with problems, let's say, for example, that we tried to put into place some kind of program that would help us to, to be better evangelists. I know that, that that's something that this congregation has, has worked a lot on and that there are many people who are active and, and busy in that. But let's say we put in place a program just to help us get better at it, just to, to improve our skill and to get more people involved in it. And at first, just like Nehemiah, everyone comes together and everyone's excited and we're all building this wall, we're all working on this program, but eventually there are problems that come up. It slows down. The work seems like it's stopping. We're not making the progress we once were. If we reach that point, 
that's when we would pull out Nehemiah 4 through 8 and say, here are three questions that we might ask. Is this what's causing the work to stop, to slow down? And the first one is, is the problem about the work itself. That's what he was dealing with in Nehemiah 4. And the solutions that he gives us, if the problem is about the work itself, if the problem is about some, some tweak that we need to make to the details, the problem is about some planning problem that we haven't thought all the way through. You know, we've, we've, uh, Nehemiah's was that they were building the wall, but he hadn't quite put a plan in place to do what happens if they're attacked by enemies. That's, that's fairly important if you're building a wall. You know, you need a plan. In. He hadn't quite put all that in place yet. There's a problem just with the planning of the program. And so he gives us two solutions to deal with that. The first is to spend a lot of time in prayer. Remember, we don't have to do these things alone. We can have the power of the great and mighty God behind us. We can seek his providence, his, his answers to what to do about these problems, to ask him to be working behind the scenes so that the work we're trying to do for him moves forward even when we run across those problems. And so he would tell us to pray about it, but then he would have us to find people to really be dedicated on trying to solve the problem. People who are really going to focus on it. Now, I hesitate to say it in that way because I'm afraid what it sounds like is sort of like a committee. And, and you know, I know that there are congregations who have committees for things, and I'm not up here to say, you know, to condemn that outright or anything like that. But I do kind of feel concerned sometimes about that idea of having like a committee because kind of the impression that a committee leaves you is this is their problem. And the rest of us don't have to worry about that. They're going to think about this, and we don't have to think about it anymore. That's not really what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah found people to work on the problem, but he did it in a way where everyone came together to help solve the problem, and then certain people in rotation were to make sure that they were focusing on that problem. And of course, how that looks, depending on the situation, is going to change. But that's, this is a group effort. And so he makes sure that the group is involved. This is a, a team effort. So he makes sure that the team has input to put it all together and to solve the problem together so everyone understands why and everyone understands what to do moving forward. And so he says, spend lots of time praying together and then spend time problem solving together and picking out people who are going to be focused on the problem to figure out how did it get this way? Can we do anything to stop the slowdown? And can we do anything to pick back up the momentum that we have lost and move forward? And along the way, it might mean accepting some role changes. You know, you think about in Nehemiah 4 when he's talking to the people and he's sort of telling them that, uh, that while they're building the wall, he needs them to essentially, you know, take turns. Sometimes you're building, sometimes you are watching out for enemies. These people are not builders or guards. You know, they're, they're shoemakers. They make clothes. They work in the temple. They're priests and, and Levites. That's not their job. But for a temporary time, he helps them see how they can do this, this changes. They can make these changes in order to see God's plan put together. And sometimes it means making sacrifices. And at the end of Nehemiah 4, you see they do that quite a bit with their their. They're taking their shifts, and they're always wearing the same clothes night and day. They make some temporary sacrifices because it's worth it, but they're willing to do that because they've spent to the time together praying about it. They're willing to do that because they've spent the time together problem-solving. How do we overcome this? And they're able to see the work the way that God sees it, and they're able to finish the work, accomplish the work, even though a problem came up, a terrifying problem, that could have completely ended the work. Nehemiah helped them see how they could keep it going. And so sometimes it's about the work. But the second question he might ask us is, is the problem about the people? Because sometimes the work is fine. There's no problem with the planning. The leaders have done a good job. It's all coming together fine. The problem is instead sometimes with the people. Sometimes people need some help to get to the right place in order to be able to keep doing the work effectively. Certainly, if people are hurting because of sin, that is always going to slow any project that we try to do down. Uh, if, if people are all involved in a project together and then one of them get caught up, gets caught up in some sin of some kind that affects the other people, that creates discord. That creates 
a lack of unity, that's always going to slow anything that we are trying to do for God down. And so uh, Nehemiah very thoughtfully leads the people to repent. He very heartfelt and seriously helps them to make amends so that the work can keep moving forward. And I think he would encourage us to, to have that kind of focus when people are caught up in sin, people who are trying to help us are caught up in sin, to be very uh, conscientious and thoughtful in showing them the sin that they're caught up in, how they can specifically make amends and then move forward so that unity can be brought together and the work can keep on moving. That helps the people who are hurt by the sin. It also helps the people who need to repent of the sin and it brings everyone together. And, uh, and then, of course, the second half of chapter 5 talks about how careful he was in his own influence. And I think that's really true. And, you know, we might think, well, this applies to the elders, the deacons, or someone like that. But really, I think Nehemiah would apply this to all of us, that we be careful in the way that we uh, uh, live our lives and, and communicate with one another and work with one another, that we don't make people feel like we're trying to take advantage of them. We don't make people feel like we don't care about them, like we will take things from them if it benefits us. You know, I would say be very careful about that, to build a relationship that is mutual, to build a relationship where, where everyone is getting what they need out of it. Because it's hard to work with people if you feel like someone is give or taking a lot more than they're giving. And I think that's what Nehemiah would warn us about in chapter 5. And so sometimes it's people hurting because of sin. Sometimes it's people hurting because of enemies on the outside. And that's what Nehemiah was dealing with in chapter 6. But his solution there was very simple. It was the exact same thing over and over again. Just to focus on God and the work. When people want to, to distract you and tear you down and, and, and make you feel like what you're doing is not valuable or good, he just basically ignores them to focus on God and the work. And so over and over again, he says basically, just really see the attacks for what they are. They're just distractions. That's what they are. To us, they can feel like a really big deal. And I'm sure to him, they felt like a big deal, but he's able to see them for what they really are. They're just distractions. When they pretend to be his friends, and then he realizes that they're not really his friends, that hurts when someone pretends to be your friend just because they want something from you. He says, that's a distraction. Notice um, he says in verse 3, he says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? He's focused on the work. When, uh, when they send him scare tactics so that he, they're trying to intimidate him to not work on the wall anymore. He says in verses 8 and 9, the work has to be done. When he's dealing with people who uh, uh, seem to be his friends, who should be his friends because they're Jews just like he is, right? The enemies from the outside are not Jews. This guy, in, later in the verse, is a Jew himself. He's a part of God's people. Uh, he would be the equivalent of a brother in Christ today. And, uh, and he's tricking Nehemiah, essentially. And Nehemiah says in verse 11, I won't flee the work. He's focused on the work. And, and, you know, naysayers that he dealt with, betrayal that he dealt with, his answer was always the same thing. Those are distractions. The work is what we are focused on. The work is what brings us together. If each one of us will focus on the work, anyone who doesn't want to focus on the work will find that they are just a distraction to what we are doing, and the work continues moving forward. Uh, but sometimes it's sin, sometimes it's enemies, but sometimes it's just a lack of preparation. And that's sort of what chapter 7 is about. He's, he's preparing them because he doesn't want the work to stop now that they've, you know, they reached a milestone. They, they, they finished the wall, and sometimes you reach a milestone, and then everything kind of stops, and nothing else happens after that. You feel like you've done something good, and Nehemiah says, really, now that we finished the wall, it's really just getting started now. Now there's bigger work to do. Now there's better work to do. But we can't do it if we aren't prepared. And so if we reach a milestone and then it just seems to kind of fizzle out, we might ask ourselves this question from Nehemiah. Are the people unprepared to work? Do they not have the leaders that they need? Have we not put someone, a certain person in place whose job is to kind of coordinate and keep it all moving and, and keep it all organized? 
Is it that the, we have a leader, but we haven't given that person, you know, people to help him? We haven't given him, uh, you know, he describes in verses 4 through, uh, in uh, verses 5, really through 66, all of the workers that he had. And then in verses 67 to 69, he describes all the tools that he needed. And then in verses 70 through 72, he describes all of the resources that were necessary so that when it came to verse 73, they were ready to work because he had given them everything that they needed. And so sometimes it's about the work, and sometimes it's about the people, but sometimes Nehemiah has to deal with the biggest problem of all. Sometimes it's just about the word of God itself and the fact that we just don't understand it right. The work has stopped because we haven't stopped to ask ourselves, is the work in compliance with God's will? Do we misunderstand something in God's will that we need to study through together and to understand, or else we won't be able to continue the work? We won't be able to finish what we're working on. And that's what chapter 8 is about. It's a problem with our understanding of the word of God. And off, you know, sometimes it's a whole congregation. Sometimes it's one person who needs just to kind of be helped along, someone that, that, uh, that we are very patient with and gentle with and just help along because they're sort of heeding the work. And so, again, there is some kind of emphasis that he puts through this. I, in verses 1 through 6, he says, sometimes people are just not prepared to receive it. We haven't created an atmosphere where they feel comfortable hearing something different than what they believe. We haven't created relationships where they feel uh, open enough to, uh, to listen to something that seems unfamiliar to them so that they might be ready to understand God's word correctly. Sometimes, though, uh, even if they're prepared to receive it, they, aren't, they just aren't connecting it to their own life. And I think that's in verses 7 through 11. He kind of talks about that. You know, that have you ever done that? You've heard a verse over and over and over again. And then one day, after a long time, you suddenly hear it as if for the first time. You just realize while you, you kind of knew what it meant, you never thought about it in connection with how you were living, what you were doing. It was like it had a whole new life because it, it, uh, it, it applied to you all this time, but you didn't realize that it applied to you all this time. And so there's something you need to change or do that you could have been doing all along, but you only just put it together. Sometimes people hear God's word, but they're not applying it to themselves. They're not connecting it to their own lives. And so sometimes people just need help, just need a very gentle but forward conversation or, or just uh, some, some encouragement to think about it from that perspective of this is God's word and I know you want to do it, but here's how your life is not quite lining up because you haven't applied it in that way. Sometimes that's just what people need. Um, and then verse 12, sometimes we know it and we want to do it, but we're just not grateful for it. I'll tell you, this is something that I struggle with a lot is, is knowing God's word. And I really do want to do God's word, but it's very hard to accomplish it sometimes because I'm not really grateful for what it has to say and how it's changing my life. I feel resentful about it, or I feel burdened by it. And Nehemiah in verse 12 would say that even when it requires great change, there is still this opportunity to rejoice because you do understand it and you want to do it. And you know, it's going to be better on the other side. Once you get through that difficulty, Sometimes people just need to see what they already know with that shift in perspective, to see it with gratefulness, to see it with eagerness, because it presents them with that opportunity. And then sometimes people just need help figuring out how to make those changes. They want to make the change. They're eager to make the change. They can't see the path forward. How on earth could I ever do that? I just need to help them figure out how to make the change. What are the gradual process that needs to be put in place so that they can make that change. Sometimes when a work gets halted, it's because there are people, groups of them, individuals of them, whose lives are not lined up with, God, with God's word. And Nehemiah kind of gives us a path forward in chapter eight on how to help people get there if they have an open heart, if they are willing. And so by asking these three main questions, we discover that the source of the problems uh, with the work can usually be found, and you can then find the right solution to solve it, to finish the work, to keep the work moving forward, so that we can continue to do things that are pleasing to God. 
that we can continue to do things that are important to God and to eternity, just like Nehemiah did. And that's, you know, I think every work and every person, every congregation sometimes needs extra strength. That it, sometimes we feel like we shouldn't, but sometimes everybody needs that. I think of Hebrews 12, 12, you know, he describes the people whose, whose knees are weak and whose hands are hanging low. They're, they need that extra strength Tylenol, right? You know, a little, a little pick-me-up, a little boost to keep moving forward. Everybody needs extra strength sometimes. And, you know, I think about Jesus. Jesus sometimes, he offers us extra st- strength. There's Matthew 11. In Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, he offers us extra strength. He says, you know, the Pharisees are trying to put these heavy burdens on you that you can't keep, but my burden is light, and I will help you to carry it. We can carry it together. He wants to help us when things get hard as individuals, as a congregation. But, you know, Jesus himself, sometimes when he walked on this earth, he needed a little extra help himself. And you think about Jesus, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is trying to convince himself to obey God to, to not, you know, not my will, your will. And then the angels come to him and they comfort him. They encourage him. They, they strengthen him. But even after all of that, and, and he's been beaten and he's had the crown of thorns on his head. He's been humiliated. He's been mocked. He's gone through all of these terrible things. He is committed to dying on the cross. He's trying to get there, carrying that beam to Gethsemane but he just doesn't have the strength to carry it by himself. He just falls down. Imagine what would have happened if the Roman guards had just said, eh, he's going to die anyway. And they had just left him there on the side of the road with that cross beam, and he had never made it to the cross. What would that mean for all of us? What would it mean for us if Simon had not showed up at that moment and uh, and and he had not carried the cross for Jesus the rest of the way? Even Jesus as a man, needed that extra strength sometimes. Everybody needs a little help sometimes. And when we ask these three questions, we're showing we really want to figure out how to overcome our problems and to find that strength that God supplies so that we can keep on doing a work that God cares greatly about. And so this evening, if there's something that you need help with, if there's something that you are finding difficult and you're not sure that you can deal with it on your own, let us help you. Let us pray for you. Let us counsel you in whatever way we can. We ask that you come forward now as we stand and as we sing. Number 312. <clears throat> they tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend within the halls of Pilate he stood without a friend